Hey everyone, I am hoping that you are all well and that you're staying safe at this kind of strange time. Uh, and I'm hoping you are having better luck with uh, listening to your lectures on video than I am having on putting them together. Uh, this is the, well, it's definitely at the third or fourth time I've tried to put this together. So I'm hoping this one works. Um, today we're going to be talking about combination antiretroviral therapy or CART and how to use these drugs uh, for both the treatment and prevention of HIV. Now there's a lot of information that we talked about last year in regards to the pathophysiology, epidemiology, risk factors, transmission, uh, all of those things we will not talk about today, but I have uh, given the lecture to you just in case you're curious about catching up. One thing I would suggest about catching up though is you look at the information about CD4 count and viral load, um, and just making sure you're understanding where uh, somebody becomes uh, AIDS defined, because we'll talk about opportunistic infections uh, later this week. So I hope today is that we can, um, by the time this is over, create appropriate antiretroviral regimens for treatment naive patients. Uh, we're not going to be working with treatment experienced patients or patients who have been on medications for a long time or have failed a number of regimens. Our goal is just to understand how to treat those who have never been on medications before. Um, based on clinical guidelines, lab tests, comorbid conditions, and other patient-specific factors. We will hopefully be able to educate patients on the benefits of antiretroviral therapy, the need for combination therapy, and the need for daily adherence for optimal outcomes. You'll be able to counsel patients about the appropriate use of these medications and potentially how to prevent and alleviate adverse events or drug drug interactions. And we'll utilize these drugs uh, in the prevention of mother to child transmission, post exposure prophylaxis and pre exposure prophylaxis. Now you'll notice that this is broken up into a bunch of um, different kind of modules. Uh, there is one that is not going to be tested, so we'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, otherwise all this information is potentially test-worthy, and I will provide a, a bit of a cheat sheet in a little while. So first some basics. Who do we treat? Uh, anybody who is HIV positive who has been uh, diagnosed as HIV positive and has a detectable viremia, meaning that there is virus in the blood, regardless of their CD4 count. Um, the one possible exception is when a patient isn't ready to start lifelong treatment or to be adherent to lifelong treatment adherence due to psychosocial or behavioral reasons. Uh, most often this is due to an underlying and untreated um, psychological condition. Um, every so often though, other things do get kind of wrapped up in the story and it's hard to adhere to medications if you are homeless or are dealing with legal issues or have domestic violence concerns. Another possible exception is with some opportunistic infections, and we'll talk about these a little bit later, but in all cases with opportunistic infections, if you don't start treatment on the day that you start um, treatment for the opportunistic infection, it's going to be within two weeks after you've started the, uh, the treatment for the opportunistic infection. And the other possible exception is for what are called elite controllers. And these are people who have been diagnosed as being HIV positive, but without medications are maintaining an undetectable viral load. So something about their, their makeup, their genetics has actually suppressed the viral load without the need for medications. So the question about whether or not we need to treat them is uh, still controversial. So most combinations that we're dealing with are going to be considered highly active. Uh, so regardless of the, the the regimen we choose, they all will work. And the question that comes up is, well, how do we decide which one we should use? So we're going to be basing our decisions on the guidelines for treatment naive patients. We will base them on resistance test results. We will also get a number of other lab tests, which we will talk about in a little bit. We'll deal with their comorbid conditions and the treatments and how those play a role in the, uh, the medications we choose. And uh, in other parts of the world, more so than New York, we will talk about blood, uh, drug availability and costs and specific drug factors. So why do we treat? The reasons that we treat are to reduce morbidity and mortality. This reduces AIDS-related complications, including those opportunistic infections that we will talk about in a bit, but also a number of complications related to AIDS attack on the, um, the HIV virus attacking other organ systems, such as the brain, with hand or the kidneys with the high van. This also reduces specific 
um, non-AIDS related complications, including liver disease, cardiovascular disease, renal disease, me metabolic disorders, and endocrine con conditions. And it reduces progression of other conditions such as hepatitis and tuberculosis. And the major reason when it comes to a public health standpoint is that we want to uh, reduce a person's viral load to undetectable, which decreases the likelihood that they are going to transmit to their partners. And we have talked about this. I know last year we talked about treatment as prevention and the U equals U campaign, which describes undetectable viral loads equaling an untransmissible um, condition. So when do we treat? This has kind of taken a, a pendulum swing. In the early days when we didn't have great medications, but we knew that our patients were going to die, we hit them with everything we had and we hit as hard as we could as soon as possible. Um, we didn't think about adverse events. We didn't think about their other medical conditions. We just needed them to stay alive. So we hit them with as many meds as we could. In the late 2000s and early 2010s, we started to have medications that were very effective, uh, but some of them had adverse events that we were a little bit more concerned about. So we started to figure if we could keep a person off of the medications until they absolutely needed it, we, we would try. Um, those numbers when we were trying to wait until somebody needed them were when a CD4 count fell below 500. In other parts of the world where it was a little bit harder to get members or patients in to see their doctors or they were dealing with other concerns, uh, they used the CD4 count cutoff of 350. But in the late 2010s, which uh, is already over a decade ago, we started to uh, see medications that were pretty impressive uh, both in terms of efficacy and in a decreased risk of adverse events. And so the idea now is that we want to hit everybody um, with a great medication. And the reason for that is that great medications will reduce morbidity and mortality. They will reduce immune activation, which is the increased pro-inflammatory cytokines and uh, chronic inflammation that are related to a, a non-suppressed viral load. And this will decrease the risk of uh, other disease states. But there's also less of a concern about long-term adverse events. And if we can get them started early, there is the public health potential that we could uh, reduce transmission to others. So there's a new kind of term or idea being thrown around that uh, as soon as somebody is diagnosed with HIV, we want to start them on medications that day, even if the lab tests that we talk about today haven't been returned. It's not done everywhere, but in places where we have the resources or the ability to do so, uh, this is definitely something that we will see more of as time moves forward. The reason for this is that for those members who were started on the same day that they're, they are diagnosed, we find that there's an improved retention in care. There's improved virologic outcomes because it reduces the, uh, the time to virologic suppression by one to two months, and it may actually reduce the size of the latent HIV reservoir. If we can preserve the CD4 count, which means we can keep it high, it's much easier to keep it high than it is to, uh, to try and catch up after the CD4 count is dropped and then try and bring it up. So the sooner we start, the better. And like I said, these medications do have better tolerability. The only exceptions are for people who cannot use a tenofovir-based regimen or for people who are living with some concern or barrier to their adherence. Preferred regimens according to the DHHS guidelines in 2019-2020 are all integrase inhibitor based regimens. Uh, we'll talk in a little bit about these medications, but anything that ends in a G-R-A-B-I-R is an integrase inhibitor. And you'll notice the preferred regimens are all integrase inhibitor based. Um, there are many alternative agents for people who can't tolerate or who, for whom they have uh, become resistant to integrase inhibitors. Uh, including protease inhibitors, NNRTIs, which are non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And uh, there is talk about medications that we can use when two of the NRTIs, tenofovir and abacavir, cannot be used. But our list and our general rule is going to be an integrase inhibitor and two, non, or two NRTIs, which are nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. I think I've taken all the... Um, abbreviations out of the slide set, but if for some reason one pops up, do know that these are the, uh, the uh, definitions of those, those abbreviations.
So before we get somebody started on HIV medications, we have to make sure we're doing an initial patient evaluation. Um, generally, the first step is to ensure that we do have an actual diagnosis for HIV. And that generally, that tends not to be too much of an issue unless it's somebody who's been moving around a lot and, uh, you know, they, they come to our clinic after having lived in some other city or village for a while. Um, we want to make sure that we actually have that HIV um, diagnosis. There were two cases while I was working in practice at ECMC. One of them uh, had a, a mental health disorder and she had somehow convinced everybody that she was HIV positive even though she wasn't. And another was diagnosed as being HIV positive and for a good 10 years had been on um, antiretroviral regimen medications but had always had an undetectable viral load. And uh, we had done some labs to just make sure that everything looked right, and it wound up that he was actually HIV negative. They had done an HIV, they had done a different test to get the diagnosis of HIV. So he lived for 10 years of his life without uh, knowing that he was not HIV positive and stayed on medications uh, for quite a long time. So it's always good to make sure you have the de the diagnosis established. We also want to consider risk factors and symptoms of opportunistic infections, just so that we know how it happened and any sort of ongoing risk that the member might have for uh, themselves or for their partners. Um, we have to consider their emotional state and emotional states will go across the board from people who are absolutely devastated and uh, considering suicide because they have no idea how to handle the situation or tell their loved ones to people who are kind of expecting that they're going to be diagnosed. And one of the concerns we had, especially in the 90s, was that uh, people who were men who had sex with men kind of, they expected that they were going to be HIV positive because of, uh, you know, the stories that they had heard on the, the stigma related to their, their, um, their orientation. Um, and they would come in and they kind of figured it was going to happen at some point, so they were just relieved that it finally did. Um, it's just a scary thought, and it's something that is not happening quite as much nowadays because of the fact that we can prevent HIV with uh, some of the medications we'll talk about a little bit later. We also have to consider their family history, which includes cardiovascular, renal, and neurocognitive issues, as well as uh, histories of malignancies. And um, we then consider any comorbid conditions that they do have currently. So we do a bunch of lab work to tell about their STI history, their cardiovascular concerns, any sort of um, endocrine or renal issues, and the liver is also something that we are going to consider very closely. And obviously, as with any patient, we're going to consider their immunization history. Uh, their social history is also very important, especially their uh, sexual, um, their risk factors and their substance use history. And we need to consider uh, the physical and the, the review of symptoms just to make sure that the patient uh, doesn't have any signs or symptoms of HIV. One of the big lab tests that we need to look at is a resistance test. And the reason that we do these for everyone entering care is that we have to consider that there are a number of patients out there who have had a mutation or a resistance transmitted to them by their partners. Um, we have to consider that when we do these tests, um, it's best to find these mutations quickly. And if somebody were to not take medications, those resistance mutations can actually disappear, uh, at least from detection, because the virus that is wild type or the virus that replicates without the presence of drug pressure grows much faster than the one that is mutated. Um, and if we were to do a test even a couple of months after uh, diagnosis, any mutations that were there could have actually gone into hiding. Um, re transmitted resistance is possible in at least um, 6 to 16 percent of people in the United States. And starting a medication that a person is resistant to would be bad because it's not treating the condition. And the other medications that they're taking are now working by themselves, which could potentially increase the rate of resistance to those medications. There are two types of resistance testing, genotypic and phenotypic. And um, both of these have their role, but generally speaking, in a treatment-naive patient, we'd be using genotypic. The other times that we use resistance testing are for people who have failed a regimen or are failing a regimen, or if we suspect that there is non-adherence um, going through their, their life history. When we do a viral load test, it's great to have as many copies as possible because this is going to be looking for um, mutations in a number of copies. But if we wanted to do this and do it right, it should be a viral load of at least 500 copies.
So these are a couple of pictures of what those um, resistance tests look like. Here's a virtual phenotype and a genotype. Um, one of the things that it's important to recognize is that this will look at NRTIs and NNRTIs, the drugs that work on reverse transcriptase, and also will work on protease inhibitors, which work on which work at the uh, protease site. Um, what's missing here is the integrase inhibitor resistance. Um, these are not on standard resistance testing. And if we want to see if somebody is resistant to an integrase inhibitor, we would have to do a separate test to get those results. Generally speaking, if we're talking about resistance testing, um, baseline resistance will actually show that over time, there's been a reduced rate of transmitted resistance uh, in the United States. So it's actually pretty rare nowadays to find resistance mutations, even though we aren't looking for integrase inhibitors uh, resistance mutations. If we were to do the special test looking for them, they aren't there either. Um, one of the reasons for this could be that people are having a much easier time taking their medications, so it's rare that non-adherence causes resistance mutations in the first place. Um, so another thing to consider is that when we do rapid testing, most of the time we're going to start those medications before the results are back. It would usually take about a week, two weeks, to uh, see results related to the resistance mutations. Um, so we're going to be using drugs with high genetic barriers to resistance. Um, one of the, or I guess two of the medications that we use are, that have high genetic barriers to resistance are some of those integrase inhibitors. So there is the potential that baseline resistance testing may not necessarily be as necessary now as it was in the past. Um, currently, it is still part of the guidelines, so we do want to make sure we have these results in most cases, but I guess to be continued, and we'll see how things play out over the next couple of years. Other important labs that we want to look at, one is the HLA B5701 test, and this will test for uh, whether a person is likely to have a, an abacavir hypersensitivity. General blood and urine testing will show um, the, the potential adverse events related to some of the medications that we use. G6PD testing is more for opportunistic infections, and we'll talk more about those this week. We also want to do a pregnancy test because if a person is pregnant, we want to make sure that we're using medications that will prevent mother-to-child transmission. Uh, we do tropism testing only if a person is going to be using uh, the CCR5 antagonist Mareviroc. We're going to be screening for any co-infections and make sure that we're treating those as much as possible. We also do serologies for potential opportunistic infections, including varicella, toxoplasmosis, and cytomegalovirus. We're screening for HPV-associated neoplasias, which involves doing cervical and anal pap smears. And um, one of the questions that will come up quite frequently is, well, with these medications, some of them can cause issues with bone mineral density. Um, should we be doing DEXA scans or checking vitamin D levels? It's always a good idea to get vitamin D levels in all of our patients, uh, but remember DEXA scans are only for um, postmenopausal women and for men who are over 50 years of age. For the rest of us, we don't really see a huge benefit to doing them, and um, for our HIV-positive patients, we don't use them either. So as an example of when those comorbid conditions or their treatments will affect how we decide to treat HIV, if a patient does have a condition, you don't want to use drugs that might exacerbate that condition. And examples would be cardiovascular disease, which protease inhibitors and abacavir might potentially uh, exacerbate. We also have renal or bone disease, which both types of tenofovir can, uh, can impact adversely. Between the two of them, and one of the reasons that tenofovir elephantamide has come out as one of the, um, the blockbuster drugs right now, is that it has less of an effect on the bone and kidney. So if you have a choice between these two, tenofovir elephantamide is your best bet. And we'll talk more about this in the next couple of uh, sections. And also, if somebody has liver disease, you have to be very careful using protease inhibitors or NNRTIs because both of these medication classes can actually impact the effect on the liver. Uh, we also want to look at an example of when a, a co-infection can actually impact how you decide to treat. And the example here is hepatitis B co-infection. In these patients, you should be using tenofovir-based regimens because tenofovir actually works against both hepatitis B and hepatitis or, and HIV. And um, both of those drugs, tenofovir DF and AF, are both good for treating HBV and HIV. 
And the other drugs that are effective in treating both conditions are amtricitabine and lamivudine. We also need to consider drugs that are used to treat other conditions because there are a number of drug interactions with the HIV medications that we're talking about. And I'm not going to ask you to remember too many of them. Uh, there may be some with the integrase inhibitors that I ask you to remember. But as a shameless plug, um, there is a New York State set of guidelines, and one of the sets of those guidelines is the ART drug-drug interactions, which talks about identifying those drug interactions and managing those drug interactions. And I have to put this in there because if you take a look at that lead author, I need to, uh, to pat myself on the back. So I'm not expecting that you know all of those, but if you are working in clinic or in a um, community setting and a drug interaction question does come up, there's a good place to look for some of your answers. Also, when it comes to coming up with a drug regimen, we need to consider drug availability and how much these drugs cost. And in the United States uh, first world problem, uh, all of these drugs are available. The question is how they're going to be paid for. And most insurance co companies do a pretty good job, though some might be pretty expensive, if, expensive, especially if they're not on the formulary. And some problems with many insurance companies is that they prefer as first tier drugs, generics or older medications. And when it comes to HIV, we don't use those older medications. The drugs that we use are not generic yet, so there is some concern that the drugs that are first tier might not necessarily be the ones that are currently recommended as treatment options for our patients. This isn't an issue with New York State Medicaid. Um, it may be with some commercial lines, and I want to say in what I've looked at, um, it doesn't seem to be too much of an issue on the Medicare side either. But in those cases where somebody can't afford or doesn't have insurance, um, there is something called the AIDS Drug Assistance Programs, which is a part of a federal law that would require each state and territory to get a, a bulk sum of money that they can put towards helping those people living with HIV, towards paying their uh, health care expenses. And New York is very liberal, and their kind of cutoffs when it comes to a person being qualified for ADAP are that a single person has to make less than $62,450 and a, a couple has to make less than $84,550. So that's pretty good money. Uh, and now it's just kind of a question of what the, what the ADAP is paying for. And again, in New York, very liberal, it pays for medicines, labs, clinic visits, and ancillary devices such as uh, glucometers and blood pressure um, sphygmomanometers. Uh, but it's also not just for antiretrovirals. Um, one of the interesting things about this, uh, this ADAP is that for New York State, it covers meds for opportunistic infections, for cancer, for vaccines, for AIDS wasting, for viral hepatitis. It covers pain medicines and antibiotics, but it also covers psychotropic medications for people who are anxious, depressed, or who are dealing with substance use disorders, cardiovascular medicines, and cholesterol medications, especially those that are um, used to treat the potential adverse events of some of these medications. Lots of GI medications and insulin, but also contraceptives and smoking cessation medications. So ADAP in New York is a pretty good deal. And when it comes to specific drug factors, these will always play a role, even when you're not talking about HIV. If a drug has a lot of adverse events, or you have to take it many times a day, or you have to take a number of pills many times a day, or if the pills are very large and it's hard to swallow, um, these are going to be reasons that people don't want to take that drug regimen. Um, there is the, uh, the concern about different types of formulation. Um, some people who can't swallow pills will try and take the, um, the liquids, but the liquids are pretty awful tasting, and most of them will try to go back to the pills after trying some of these flavors. There's also the inconvenience of taking medications, and one of the problems that happens is that a lot of times, if you're taking a daily medication for a condition, every day you think about having that condition. So that makes it tough for our patients who, uh, who are already feeling um, stigma or um, some self-hatred for their condition. And then other adherence issues that come up would be lack of insight into disease state, lack of trust in the healthcare system, a low health literacy, a belief in another type of treatment, um, including prayer or herbs, or sometimes even foods. Um, there's a lack of social support and other socio-behavioral issues. And my question for you that we won't answer today, but I want you to think about how pharmacists can prevent some of these other adherence issues.